I'm Dr. Remington Nevin, an occupational and preventive medicine physician and former U.S. Army public health officer, and I'm now executive director of the Quinism Foundation, a nonprofit that raises awareness of the dangers of viral medications. As we talked about last night, um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine aren't new molecules, they aren't new medications, they've been around for a while. Can you briefly talk about what we know about them, you know, up to this point? Sure. So uh, both drugs were developed uh, around the time uh, of uh, World War II, towards the end of World War II uh, and 1950, in the case of hydroxychloroquine. Both designed as replacements for a drug called Adabrin uh, or, or Quinacrin, which was quite toxic. And it was thought that these two drugs did not share the same neuropsychiatric adverse effect profile that plagued uh, Quinacrin or Adabrin. But we know that both drugs do cause neuropsychiatric adverse effects, including changes in mood, sleep, cognition, uh, as well as uh, neurologic problems, such as uh, dizziness, uh, vertigo, uh, tinnitus, and hearing impairment. Sure. Um, one of the things you said last night, well, okay, so the, the primary use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine around the world is treatment of malaria. However, there's no malaria in the United States. Um, so can you talk about what it is now typically used for here in the U.S.? Right. So soon after hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil was developed, it became widely used for treatment of rheumatologic disease. And that's been the primary use of the drug ever since. So even though it is primarily an anti-malarial drug, we have experience with the drug uh, typically in older uh, persons who are treating their rheumatologic and autoimmune disorders. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me that we talked about last night was you basically said, um, it was kind of a yes but, like yes, this probably will work, we know it has antiviral properties, but um, can you maybe go into that a little bit more detail and what your concerns are here? So, these drugs belong to a class called quinoline. The of the quinoline is such that it renders them useful as anti-malarial. But the same property also likely underlies their toxicity. And if, if this property that's of interest in use uh, of these drugs as antivirals, the fact that they can accumulate in uh, certain areas of the cell alter the function of the cell, and, and in so doing, you think if you're with viral replication, but that same property may underlie the drug's uh, neurologic and psychiatric patterns. So the same thing that makes it effective makes it potentially toxic. That's right. Um, the FDA right now has just said um, these drugs are approved for compassionate use. Um, your concern as expressed to me was that the, because of the urgency behind this, it will get approved for, or it'll, it'll start being used for general prophylaxis. Can you talk about um, why you're concerned about that? So the use of these drugs outside of uh, close medical supervision is very problematic because of the potential for these drugs to cause neuropsychiatric adverse effects that may go unrecognized by the patient. I'm very concerned at the possibility that members of the public will attempt to obtain quantities of these drugs without a doctor's prescription or without any medical or public health oversight. That possibility should trouble us all. Additionally, I'm very concerned that draft guidance that I've reviewed today from the FDA suggesting that in the midst of this pandemic, the FDA will accept a delay of up to six months in the reporting of adverse effects for licensed drugs. And the possibility can't be excluded based on this guidance that a newly licensed version of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19 that is resulting in many serious adverse reactions wouldn't uh, result in the companies behind these drugs licensing reporting this to the FDA. That's, I think, something very problematic that should uh, prompt a revision in this draft guidance. Yep. 
Um, two questions left. I think that'll actually put us at six total. So sure. um, it's not like I'm the data reporter or anything. Um, What were they? What were they? Um, so, you you had talked about um, people take these drugs. People have already started reaching out to you about the uh, possibility of accessing these drugs and, and, and using them. What you know? What what have you heard just right now, or what are people asking you right now? So I have been inundated by phone calls, tweets, and uh, emails from individuals who heard the possibility that these drugs may be effective, wanting to acquire supplies uh, outside of the traditional medical or, or uh, pharmacy uh, channels. And this is, I think, very dangerous. And uh, while these studies are underway and while the drugs are being considered uh, to be licensed for this new indication, I, I think it's important that public health officials emphasize these drugs should not be used by members of the public without supervision. Great, thank you. Last question. Um, pe people are going, to, you know, the reason, as we, I asked you last night, the reason that these extreme and potentially toxic drugs are used is because malaria is also a very dangerous disease. Um, do you think, or people are going to ask, I think, is coronavirus not at that same level where the risk of these drugs um, makes it worthwhile to, um, is, it, is it not worth taking the risk to deal with coronavirus? So there are two very different uses being considered for these drugs. The first is in treatment of serious life-threatening illness. When someone's in the hospital, potentially in need of a respirator, I, I don't think that there's any concern with exploring the use of the drug for that indication. The real concern is that these drugs may become widely available for use by members of the public in an attempt to prevent or prophylax disease or possibly treat mild cases of infection. We simply don't have enough evidence at the moment to know whether the risks of doing that would outweigh whatever potentially minimal benefits would come from that use. Sure. Dr. Nevin, thank you so much.